Okay. So, uh, next presenters are Jan Purchase and Ryan Trollip. And uh, Jan is a well-known expert in decision modeling and uh, optimization. And uh, he also uh, a book author, uh, famous book in decision management together with James. And uh, Jan is working for more than 25 years in uh, investment banking industry, uh, focusing on decision automation. <laughs> And uh, also, he is an expert in machine learning, integrated use of machine learning and uh, uh, decisioning. So, uh, but today, Jan, together with uh, Ryan Trollip from Decision Management Solution, will talk about the progress uh, with DMN on ramp. This is initiative they uh, both introduced two years ago a decision camp 2021 and it's really interesting uh, where they are today and uh, what we can expect in the future so jan ryan go ahead thank you very much thank indeed you. jacob it's a real pleasure to be presenting at decision camp once again and welcome everyone so as jacob said two years ago at uh, dc 21 uh, the dnm on ramp was launched and this is an organization for supporting the incremental adoption of DNM amongst businesses. And this presentation is essentially, as Jacob said, an update on the progress we've made since then. So we'll be discussing some core DNM uh, use cases, or if you like, application scenarios, and what tool facilities they require to support them. And we'll also be announcing and demonstrating the DNM on-ramp interactive website, which is designed to help potential adopters of DNM understand the value proposition of the standard and what tool support their particular application requires. So of course, everyone at the conference absolutely loves DMM. I think that goes without saying, possibly to different extents, however. But I think most people would accept that it's, at the moment at least, the best and most widely adopted standard for decision modeling. And why do we love it? Well, for many reasons, not least because <clears throat> it's a great focal point for the identification uh, and definition of decisions collaboratively amongst many stakeholders, first and foremost, the business subject matter experts. It allows the companies to shine a bright light on their operational decision making and review decisions, collaboratively improve it and make decisions an explicit corporate asset. As we've seen in the last uh, two days, DNM is excellent at integrating traditional business rules, AI and machine learning models and constraint logic into one coherent framework for specification and very soon automation as well. And this is an extremely powerful combination, as many people have said uh, more eloquently than I have. It, DNM improves communication as well, particularly of business objectives and context. It reduces the risk of key person dependency as a result and the information loss that can sometimes happen when individuals leave a company. And DNM helps the interchange, not just between DNM tools, of course, but between tools and third party products, and crucially, between human beings. But, you know, there's a bit of a snag still with the adoption of DNM. The adoption of DNM is a hard problem because it's big. DNM is a bit of a beast. And the DNM standard, although very impressive document, is unapproachable to many adopters who try to read it. Now, in fairness, of course, it was never intended for that audience. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a document aimed principally at vendors and implementers. But nevertheless, I have known potential adopters read it and recoil in fear. Users understand the benefit of a conformance-led approach, but it's really hard because the standards three-level approach to conformance really conveys the impression that DMN is very much an all or nothing affair. Um, it, it seems like a, a mountain that one has to climb. It has to be said that in addition, some vendors over time have compromised on some of the harder 
demands of the standard because perhaps certain parts of the standard don't quite fit their product roadmap or because their their current products already support the same functionality in a different way or perhaps the vendors have an ideological opposition to certain parts of the standard but for whatever reason this means that vendors tend to go their own way in many cases and dnm therefore becomes a rather mitigated standard um, and this again discourages adoption now the on-ramp is designed to try and address some of these problems we want to give businesses a roadmap to adoption based on their need not on three fixed levels uh, of, com of conformance and we want to articulate if you like the useful foothills uh, of this mountain that is the adoption of dnm in total so what effect does does this trying to climb this mountain have on on people and, and projects and endeavors well and, and when I use the term decision automation in this, this presentation, I'm referring both to the automation side and the management side. But it's true, I think, that too many decision automation projects are still failing to give any kind of return or the return that they should, let alone scale to enterprise levels. And this is in part due to a lack of shared practice and a lack of, of know-how of, of a broad uh, section of the community. There's a a concise, there's a lack, I should say, of a concise understanding of what decision automation is exactly and what it can do for you. And this isn't really helped by the contradictory pitches from product and service vendors that just tends to deepen the confusion. Many interest groups and service providers tend to focus on the detail, uh, the use of technologies in particular, the use of tools, their strengths and weaknesses. And they lose sight sometimes of the overall achievement of sound and effective decision automation. And there's also a, a lot of fragmentation as well. There are, there are clusters of successes, of course, and some of those successes are truly astounding, but there's virtually no communication between projects, not even sometimes inside the same company. Um, and sometimes, of course, this is because of the proprietary nature of the, of the projects, and that's entirely understandable. But even so, there's a, a definite dearth, there's a definite absence of detailed uh, case studies that new practitioners in particular can learn from. And there's also a lot of vendor siloing as well. Um, one of the games I play with some of the uh, consultants I work with is to tell from uh, the consultants uh, from dialogue with another consultant uh, to try and tell as soon as possible which tool set they use. And very often their approach to the problem, their best practices are all very much marked by the particular tool they're using. And I sometimes wonder if that's entirely healthy. As a result of this, um, there's a lack of cohesion, a lack of industry focus on uh, decision automation, or at least I think there could be much more focus. Let's be positive about this. I think there could be a better understanding, a better shared understanding of, of the benefits of decision automation among potential users than there is now. And that's, that's the kind of problem we're trying to address. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about uh, who the DNM on-ramp are and who we think our audience is, but I'm going to spend more time delving into the current outputs of the DNM on-ramp. In particular, uh, an identification of the separate use cases to which we think DNM should be applied and uh, you know, some directions for new uh, scenarios there. And we, we call those, those use cases scenarios. A flexible means of categorizing tool capability, and we call this uh, feature groups, and a method for combining these two things, combining scenarios and features to determine what individual adopters need from a tool set and from an environment. And at the end of the presentation, um, with Ryan's help, I'd like to share with you the beta version of our website for DMN adopters. And lastly, we need your help. We would like to encourage people to join our review committee. More about that later. So, what is the DNN on-ramp then? So we are essentially a collection of practitioners, stakeholders, 
academics and vendors who all believe that DNM adoption is not an all or nothing affair. As uh, Van Gogh says, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. And what we mean by this is that there are several small subsets of DNM that are self-contained and, and that have excellent uh, standalone business value. And that this value increases as these techniques are incrementally combined. It doesn't have to be uh, all or nothing. As I said, we believe that DNM should be adopted incrementally, and we provide, if you like, a staircase up the mountain of conformance and adoption. That is vendor neutral, that is as far as we can make it pragmatic, and which is based on the genuine business need which occurs at the time. We try to give adopters of DNM a structured means of determining their tool requirements based on their needs. We recommend specific scenarios for using DMM, but always we leave the final choice to adopters. We leave them to determine which of these scenarios is the most appropriate for their purpose and their current stage of maturity. And we leave them to select the tools they need based on our framework. As I said, our approach is pragmatic. It's based on our experience of uh, decision automation projects, not on any kind of ideology or product. In addition, we're hoping also to raise awareness of DMN outside the typical uh, application uh, to, the to the broader community, not just modelers. We're trying to share suggested best practices. We don't use the term uh, best practices in the hub. We try to use advised practices or suggested practices. And we always try to bear in mind that a lot of these are context specific. We're trying to build a community of practitioners um, that is based on sharing techniques uh, and case studies. And in, in some senses, we're trying to amplify and build on the great work that uh, Jacob has done in bringing this community together. And please note, we're not at all um, against or criticizing the DMN standard here or the TCK or any of the other uh, ancillary machinery of uh, DNM adoption. We're not proposing uh, an alternative to any of these. We hold all of them in very high regard. We are just a complement uh, to these artifacts. So who are we? Well, the DNM on-ramp is a member of the Decision Automation Organization, DAO. And this is a nonprofit entity focused on advancing the practice of decision automation very generally. Uh, the on-ramp publishes all of its output through the DAO, and soon it's going to introduce a feedback mechanism once these uh, deliverables become publicly accessible. We're made internally of two committees, the main committee and the review committee. And both are, as I said, mixtures of academics, vendors, and industry practitioners. And it's vital to our mission that all three of these constituencies are fully represented. The main committees whose, who, whose members you see here uh, produce and refine resources, which we'll talk about a bit more later on. They collect case studies and they document effective practices uh, and publish them. I cannot forget the review committee, of course. The, this committee evaluates our output and keeps us honest. It not only imposes a very strong quality control check on what we produce, but it also has in the past suggested many additional products that, that we've overlooked. Uh, and these have been incorporated into the core offering. Among them, an enhanced glossary of terms for people new to decision automation and a definition of our audience. I'd like to thank in particular uh, in the committee, I'd like to thank Marwim for the excellent stewardship uh, he's shown over the group for the last two years. The review committee have been very patient with us in helping us polish the materials we've produced thus far. And we're looking for more reviewers. And I'll be showing you how you can join the effort uh, at the end of the presentation. So who do we consider to be our audience? Well, in a nutshell, um, general users of DNM and, and, and those 
those people uh, that have a vested interest in created decision automation, vendors and consultants. And the user community can, can best be divided further into these three stratas. Business experts who, of course, uh, are looking to DNM for a transparent and a rich way to communicate and uh, define decisions and who want a business value oriented view of decisions. But the other thing that DNM offers, let's not forget, is a marketplace for business experts to acquire talented ind individuals who have a scope and an experience to actually represent this, uh, this business logic and to teach them. So the benefit of a standard is it creates a marketplace. What we're trying to add to this marketplace is a lower barrier of entry by using uh, incremental adoption and to raise awareness of the different DNM scenarios that are available and have seen success in various projects and to provide advised practices for all of them. Enterprise architects, of course, have a different focus. They're looking at interoperability, a decision service definition, and of course, to discover what data is required uh, that they need to provision for all of the decision servers in their architecture. We hope to provide them a way of determining the different values of DNM scenarios to select the right one, and also, of course, uh, advise best practices as before. And finally, systems integrators. Uh, they're looking for traction across multiple vendors and multiple products. And that's what DNM gives them, the ability to, to gain leverage in multiple places at once. And what we seek to offer them is a vendor selection pathway, a structured way to choose the products and the environments which make their offering most compelling. For vendors, we very humbly want to offer a structure to assess their level of tool support for various DNM scenarios. We want to provide some input to their roadmap planning on the basis of scenarios important to their client base. And we recognize that not all vendors will want to implement all of DNM and be completely 100% compliant. They just want to implement those parts which are most crucial to their customer base. And by incremental adoption, we're essentially relaxing this strict conformance, these very differentiated levels into a, a more continuous, uh, uh, a continuum of, if you like, of adoption, which is based on DNM usage scenarios and which encourages new vendors uh, to enter the market because it's somewhat easier to do so. And for consultants in decision automation, we're helping them to realize what skills are needed to support the various DNM scenarios. Uh, and also their planning and their training when they're with a client who's preparing to upgrade from one of the less demanding DNM scenarios to one of the more demanding ones. So I'm going to focus in this presentation on three of the outputs that we've now generated, and Ryan is going to demonstrate them. First of all, to understand what users need from DNM, we have produced seven distinct standalone uses for DNM with their business value. To structure how we go about assessing tool capability, we've got 13 separate axes of feature groups. And mappings are a way of relating these two things. So given the scenario you need to use, you can determine what feature groups and what features inside those groups are essential to, uh, to, to realize your vision. The best way to understand this is through example. So first of all, what are scenarios? Well, the committee has defined a set of scenarios. So far, there are seven of them, but we're looking at more. These are self-contained use cases for DNM, focused, that can deliver a defined business value. Each scenario defines the circumstances in which it should be applied and the prerequisites it has to work effectively. Each scenario has relevant advised business practices suggested by experienced practitioners. In order to find out which scenarios are most appropriate uh, to a given business, they need to work on 
seeing which of these business goals they align to most strongly at any particular time. And it may be more than one, but these goals include assessing business priorities, which is about articulating what business capabilities are most valuable to them at their current trajectory. Uh, and of course, as companies evolve, that's going to change very radically. But nevertheless, what is valuable and important right now? Targeting business capabilities, which is determining which operational decisions would be most helped by automation and where to draw the boundary between the human and automated uh, execution of decisions. Technology transformation, which is about providing a, a stable bedrock on which to base a transformation program to exploit specific technologies. And building shared awareness is about documenting decision making to support the training of new personnel and to promote consistency within a company, which is essential. And finally, but not least, provisioning data, understanding what data is needed to make new, uh, new decisions and what is not. Then using these goals, companies can select scenarios that are most relevant to them at the moment. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of these scenarios exhaustively because time doesn't really allow, um, but I will cover a, a few of them because I think that they, they merit explanation. So the, one of the least demanding scenarios, and this often surprises people, is the decision inventory. And that's quite simply just mining simple definitions of a set of, of decisions in a business area, along with um, some concrete ideas about their outcomes, their possible outcomes, and about their performance goals, their, their business performance metrics. And this identifies high level opportunities for further work and possibly decision automation in the long run. And it may involve uh, listing decisions or building simple context diagrams. But the goal here is to take the first step to explicitly recognize, define, and differentiate uh, key decisions in terms of outcomes and goals. And, and the business benefit of this, of course, is making those goals clearer, making the spreading the understanding of what these decisions are, and most importantly, disambiguating decisions uh, and promoting consistency uh, among uh, the company, among collaborators in a company. And for some and for some companies, believe it or not, this step um, is is still fairly revolutionary. This. Scenario here is an incremental improvement on that. It focuses on looking how decisions are broken down, how decisions consist of sub-decisions, their internal structure, um, and to a lesser extent, uh, how they depend on each other. And it helps to identify uh, reuse opportunities, and it helps to bring out more detail um, and commonality amongst different decisions. And the two other scenarios I'd like to focus on because they they require, they have similar names, but they have very different meanings, a data requirements definition and data-driven decision definitions. And these are very different scenarios for a DNM. Um, DNM is very, very well suited to data requirements definition scenario. This involves defining decisions for the purpose of identifying and evaluating what data is required to make a decision. And more importantly, almost, if we have a subset of that data, what can we usefully do right now whilst we're trying to augment the data uh, later on? And also about understanding the impact that a change of data source or a loss of a data source can cause in decision making and how to deal with it. The value proposition of this particular scenario is avoiding the over-provisioning of data, which can be disastrously expensive. And uh, I think many of you listening here will have, have heard of cases of this occurring. And even more damaging, finding out that you have data gaps rather late in the day, which can cause massive delay in projects and uh, a massive expense. That is to be contrasted with uh, data-driven decision definition, which is describing decisions that learn from data or that even learn from experience. Um, so typically these use techniques like machine learning and AI 
And um, I want to differentiate between those two because they're very different. Um, I'm, I'm going to differentiate between learning from data and learning from experience because those two of themselves are very different. Uh, learning from data is traditional machine learning. You train uh, a machine learning model. It learns from historical data. That learning then typically finishes when you have a decision model and you, you deploy it. But learning from experience is where uh, models continue to train even in production. So they are constantly being updated. And this scenario, um, this, this learning from experience is a, is a fairly new, uh, what's called offline or, or rather online learning, uh, a fairly new application of DNM. So this scenario involves defining how machine learning models are used, their business goals, uh, their features, the definition of their features and how those features are engineered. Uh, it involves capturing the assumptions of machine learning models, for example, the distribution of data inputs, model discontinuities where regions of the, uh, of the problem space where individual models may perform very badly. Um, and it shows how machine learning models are used both with other machine learning models. We have a collection of models, an ensemble of models, which are designed to be used either collectively or to be selected between, um, or how decision models are used in conjunction with more vanilla business rules and, and even with um, constraint solvers. And lastly, this is about integrating uh, decision making with ML ops. So uh, due to time, I'm not going to cover the rest of these in detail, but I'm sure uh, Ryan will be able to, uh, if you ask him nicely. Uh, the set of scenarios I've listed here doesn't enforce any particular order. I'm not trying to imply this is a progressive order, it could, but it could be used to plan one. The next brick in the wall is the concept of the feature group. And this is an independent axis of functionality of a DNM modeling tool and its immediate environment. And feature groups include such things as DRD support, the extent to which the tool supports DRDs, decision logic support, the extent to which a tool um, supports the definition of logic, the, the degree of support for KPIs, uh, reporting, interchange, and so on. I'm going to go through a more comprehensive list of these in a minute, but what I want to point out from these examples is note how each feature group is completely independent of the others. Their orthogonal dimensions, if you like, in the functionality, in the capability of tools. And each of these, of these feature groups provides a way of grading, progressive grading of level of support in a tool. And as a consequence, feature groups are represented as graphs. And some of these graphs are linear chains, as we'll see in a minute, are linear chains of features which represent an order which itself represents successive levels of improving sophistication of a, of a feature. Other feature groups, on the other hand, have related but distinct features, features that don't have any dependence on each other and don't have any, don't connote any uh, progression as such. And most feature groups are somewhere in between uh, those two, uh, those two spaces. They're, they're just graphs. So all of these graphs represent an incremental scale of functionality, both of DNM modeling tools and the surrounding environment. And they represent this feature groups as a whole represent a disciplined way to compare tools. And it's better than a scorecard because it represents the progression on independent axes of functionality. And because it takes the, the specific needs of user communities into account. So every tool on the market will satisfy every feature group to varying extents, providing a means of determining how well that tool overall supports a specific DNM scenario. Let's look at some examples. So I've got two feature groups here. Um, the first of them is the, the DRD support feature group. And the second is the logic definition support feature group. Let me start with the DRD support. So like all uh, feature groups, this is a graph. It starts here on the left and you read it from left to right. Um, and this node here, which begins all the graphs 
just means no functionality. So this is where a tool would be if it didn't offer any support for DRDs. It would be in, on, the, on the starting block, as it were. And then successively, each of these circles denotes a feature, a tool feature. So this one here denotes the ability to support the uh, four basic shapes of DNM, uh, input data, decision, knowledge source, and BKM. And then we see these lines, and these lines represent um, dependencies. And the reason the dependencies are here, because this particular feature here, the ability to support groups and annotations, wouldn't be very useful if there were no shapes. So there's a different dependency here. And by traversing this dependency, you are gaining, you are becoming progressively more uh, functional. You are offering a higher level of functionality. And so this particular graph includes uh, features for styling, that is to say, changing the, the shape and the, uh, not the shape, but certainly the color, the text, the weight of the text, the font, and various other things to represent um, additional information to your decision model, perhaps um, classification of decisions or some such. Um, it, this feature represents uh, the ability to support machine learning, the ability to support, for example, uh, knowledge source templates, which enable us to document um, training data sets, to document the types of models being used and the assumptions they have about the joint distribution of their inputs and so on. And um, this particular feature represents to what extent the tool validates uh, the DRD, whether it prevents users from entering nonsensical input or just draws their attention to it. And of course, representing uh, decision services, which can in turn be improved by specific support for invoked decision services and invo invoked uh, BKMs. You'll notice that there is a color code here. Um, each of these features uh, is blue if it's already supported uh, by the standard. Um, and it's orange or orange yellow if it's an aspirational uh, feature. In other words, it's a feature not yet supported in the mainstream, but certainly one that is um, perhaps one day to be included in part in the standard. And if we look on the right hand side, um, a very, very similar idea here. Um, we start with the ability to define logic using simple freeform text. Um, so this is designing. Uh, this is this is specifying logic as a as a specification, but then could become boxed, or we could go down having a business oriented execution language leading to boxed logic, and so on. I'm not going to go into too much more detail about this um, because I think you you get the point. But one not one feature group that I would like to emphasize because it's going to come up a bit later on is the support for uh, key performance indicators. And at the moment, the standard supports freeform KPIs. Um, it gives a great deal of, um, of, of free reign about how KPIs are supported. But as you'll see, some scenarios require more than that. Some scenarios require that we firmly structure the KPI, that we have a defined way of measuring the KPI, we have a defined target for the KPI, and we have a defined timescale for the KPI. Um, so this is this is nailing us down and it's making the KPI truly measurable. And from then on, you can make the KPI monitored to see how it, it performs against that measuring. And I, I seem to remember that it was Denis, I could be misattributing this, but I think it was Denis who mentioned that um, KPIs are much more effective when they're closed. They're much more effective when you're measuring them and feeding back on them. And that's the point of this particular feature group. And from monitored KPIs, we, we move to alarms when the KPIs are not met, dashboarding and visualization to, to show how well they were or were not met, and long-term persistence of KPI performance over time. So other feature groups in, include uh, repository support, the extent to which a tool distinguishes between uh, decision requirements diagrams and a decision requirements graph, and to what extent separate DRDs are just drawings versus views on the same submodel. Decision implementation, the extent to which a tool supports a local execution, simulation, test case definition, execution, 
um, deployment of decision models and even execution analysis. Version control, which is how much a tool supports um, linear and branch-based revision control, either internally or by integration with an external versioning system like Git. And almost in my view, more importantly than this, how the tool supports visual differencing, the visual um, cues about what parts of the DRD have changed between versions and how the logic has changed. User collaboration, the degree of provision for in-tool communication of issues, um, feedback amongst perhaps a collaborating team that may be geographically distributed, but are all working together on the same model. And they need a way that's more effective than email of exchanging um, differences of opinion, um, intent about what they're going to do, what they're going to change, and so on. No substitute for normal human communication, but certainly mm -hmm. a valuable aid to situational awareness. Term and source management, the ability to uh, build vocabularies, dictionaries, ontologies even, uh, into a model, and also the integration of knowledge sources with document repositories. Validation, I don't think that needs a great deal of explanation. Um, security, this surprises some people, the sophistication with which tools can handle access management, not, not at a file level, that's obviously a, a, a trivial problem, more at a using role-based security inside a decision model to make sure that the credentials a user has dictates what they can see. Interchange, a fairly obvious one, how tools input and output things and how symmetric the support for input and output is, uh, and search and reporting, particularly the ability to do semantic reporting, to produce reports based on things like model complexity, uh, and also to be able to generate DRD subviews from a query. And the last part of the puzzle is mappings. Mapping is quite simply how we join a scenario and a feature group. So for a given scenario, what features inside each feature group do we think are essential, nice to have, and extraneous? And for example, this is the mapping for the decision definition scenario when we're looking at the DRD support feature group. So you'll recognize this graph. It's the one that we uh, that I walked through just a few moments ago. But you'll see the color scheme has changed to represent the fact that this green feature here is essential. And the orange feature here is very strongly recommended. And all the others are extraneous in our view. Now, that might seem very conservative. It might seem we're, we're asking very little here. But bear in mind just how far down the sophistication this particular scenario is. And also remember that this effort is attempting to try and make uh, adoption as easy uh, and as incremental as possible. So these concepts are um, perhaps great fun, great fun for me to discuss, but a little hard to understand at an abstract level. So I'm now gonna hand over to my colleague, Ryan, who is gonna show us what this looks like by taking us through the on-ramp interactive web demonstration. And this will show you what potential adopters of DNM might experience by way of feature groups, scenarios, and mappings. Ryan, over to you. Thanks much, Jan. Just wanna check if my audio is on. Is my audio on? All good. You can hear me? All right. I can, so I can certainly hear you. Yeah. Yes, yes, we okay. can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So thanks very much, Jan, for, for taking us through that. And, and thanks for your leadership on the committee over the last uh, two years, cracking the whip and driving everybody forward. Um, it's been a lot of fun, I think, uh, working with the group, um, both the, the committee and the review group. I see Brian's on, uh, Denny, Marwin. Um, yeah, thanks much, you guys, for your contributions as well, as well as the rest of the group. So what I'll, I'll do is take you through a uh, just a scenario of what we have here, and it's it's and bear in mind this is still under construction, so we're busy building a, a interactive um, web experience. That we thought about different ways of presenting all this information, and it's a lot of information that we've collected over time. 
And we figured the, the most sort of modern way to do that is to provide an interactive environment where folks can can go and play with different scenarios. Um, so we'll launch this and uh, you'll have a page where you have an interactive scenario page. You can um, read a bit more about DMN if you like. Um, there's uh, some, some write-ups for folks that want to learn more, or you can go read the sort of complete terminology guide if you're so inclined, more studious than me. And um, there's a video, an interactive, just a sort of a video guide to help folks understand how to use the tool uh, for folks that are new to DMN. You know, obviously we're targeting not only folks with experience within DMN, but also uh, folks that are new to, to DMN and trying to understand what they should leverage and, and how they should uh, onboard their organizations or as practitioners to, uh, to DMN. We, so this just a, a brief overview of the structure of this, and then we'll get into the details. Uh, it's essentially a four step interactive. So the first step, we're deciding what we want to do as a business. So if, we, if you're doing some technology transformation, um, you're trying to prioritize various things and talking from more of a practical um, uh, point of view, you know, working with companies like we went into an energy company the other day and we were uh, looking at areas of automation. They're like, we know we want to automate, but we're not sure where to start, right? Um, those kinds of scenarios, or they might have a, um, a whole list of projects that they want to do for the year, and they're trying to budget and, and prioritize, that, prioritize those, those projects uh, in that case. Um, if they have a known target use case, like, hey, we know we need to automate claims, or you know, we have to uh, rewrite the system, and part of it has some automation in around uh, decisions, so they have a very specific use case in mind. It could be that they're looking to um, train people specifically, like how do you do I said disability claims. Uh, how do we actually do that today? It's not very clear. It's all in people's heads. We need to get that nicely mapped out. Um, and then Jan talked uh, extensively about the, the data scenario, which is a, a much more common thing these days, but a very useful case where certain companies like, um, for example, credit card companies that, that are, you know, the big three sort of co companies, they see themselves more and more as sort of data companies these days. Um, they're sort of had a nice broad view of the data and they're looking down towards the banks and they can sell various services across these, the financial industry. So they might be looking to get more value out of their data as a whole, right? So quite a common thing to see right now. And on the second level, we, you know, if we select one of these, let's say um, we're doing a transformation, there are three sort of activities that you would typically do not limited to, but typically do for a transformation or for uh, people or for data uh, for various cases, right? So what we're doing is activating uh, these activities or scenarios, and we may then select a scenario like uh, decision inventory. So decision inventory is, is quite uh, quite simple. It is what it sounds. You take an, take an inventory of what decisions you can potentially automate or you have in, in your organization. Um, that's quite a common one. We do that quite a lot these days um, where we go into organization and they, they're they looking to increase the level of automation. There's, uh, you know, relationship definition and, and a whole bunch of other um, scenarios which we we can take you through in detail. I won't go through those in detail right now, but um, you can imagine what these are for. Um, and then on the third level, we have uh, these uh, diagrams, right? So what we're showing here, as, as Jan pointed out, um, what's nice to have is, is what's needed functionality to support these activities um, in the various uh, dimensions. So DRD support, which Jan went through, model support, decision logic, and you can sort of skip through here and look at all the different uh, dimensions that are involved. Um, and then on the fourth level, we have the uh, explanations that are coming up with that. So each of these, you know, obviously has a description. Not everybody's going to know what what we mean by these terms. So we've described all of those, and they dynamically change as we sort of skip through the form. So we don't have to go through an entire uh, dictionary of of uh, terms, right? So basically, people can sort of select exactly what they want to do, and get down to what they need to do. To achieve that and then get an understanding of exactly what it means uh, in four steps. 
So why 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 do we do this? Obviously, you know, some folks have to select tooling, but they also, you know, may want to train themselves up on certain areas of DMN and sort of focus on on those areas um, as practitioners. And they may be looking at very specific uh, use cases uh, and specific activities that they're looking at the organization. So what, let's take an example. So if we are, for example, doing a uh, transformation, maybe a modernization initiative or something within an organization. And I can say I want to do decision inventory because I need to go and figure out what are all the decisions I have. So I might run a workshop or two to figure that out. Um, but I also want to know what all the relationships. So I go to a sort of another, another level of depth, not just identify the decisions, but also sort of start to map out the relationships with those decisions. So in that case, I can select both of those, and you can see there's obviously more functionality needed now because we're combining these two um, activities. Um, and if I want to also do data-driven decisions as well for that transformation, I can you know, look at that, um, that that case as well. Uh, so that's how folks would use this tool. They would come through, they would understand you know, what activities they want to do, and then drive down to the, the details. There's some explanations on what we mean by, by these dimensions. Um, so they can read up about you know, what does model support mean, not everybody will know what a DRD is at <laughs> that stage. There's decisions requirements diagram, and there's some explanations around uh, to help folks uh, with that as well. Yeah, and if you have you know any questions on this, this will be launched. Uh, we don't have a specific launch date yet, um, but as we pull this out, we're going to launch this, and then we'll share this with the community. Folks can go and. Um, you know, come in here and interact with that. And, and welcome to join the review group if you want to get an early preview of what's going on here and and, and uh, interact or, or provide your feedback. I would imagine, you know, vendors specifically or especially would want to to give feedback and shape what's what's going on in here. So I encourage you to join the the group and to uh, participate in that as well. Let me switch it over. Just going to go back to the slides quick. Yeah, so so one of the most beneficial side effects of this process um, was identifying new functionality requirements that are rarely actually available in current tools, but which nevertheless are required by some of the scenarios we're coming up with. Um, so, for example. Um, the data-driven scenario is an obvious example of this in that when you start incorporating AI models into your uh, decision models, then you are going to need structured and monitored KPIs, as I mentioned before. You're going to be, need the ability to determine how well things are performing. Uh, you're going to need greater interpretability, both the knowledge of the relative significance of all of your inputs and how much their difference, their, what, what their gradient is, if you like, what, what kind of impact they're having. And also for any given outcome of a decision, you know, how close you were to another outcome. How, how close were you to, to making a, a completely different decision? Uh, how precarious is the result? And this is sometimes called uh, perturbment analysis. Um, explanation generation is a, is a hot topic now as well the justification of a, of a decision or the outcome of a decision and all of the interim working. Um, obviously a log is just not sufficient for this. And it's my hope that we can use generative AI to provide a, a, a human readable justification for an output. Um, and then there's the general support for machine learning models, which uh, James Taylor was talking about yesterday, feature definition, um, training set attribution, determining what the what the joint distribution assumptions are of your inputs mm -hmm. so that you can know when your model is is out of its comfort zone and also um I, i've learned from experience that um decision models are a great way of documenting ensembles and 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 actually executing them um it's it's an incredibly powerful technique for that um we're getting a little bit low on time so i'm going to very quickly cover the benefits um as well for the data requirements scenario focusing on the ability to search data dependencies. That's a function that is, is quite rare still, but it, it's not a text search. It shouldn't be confused with a text search, but it is 
um, that the ability to be able to follow the thread of dependency, sometimes conditional dependency, through all models or through all nodes in a decision model to work out what effect, if any, uh, a, a, an individual data value had. Fine grain knowledge source management. So the ability not only to map knowledge sources onto individual documents, but sections within documents. And that was very relevant to some, some uh, presentations by, um, by Denis and by Ron earlier on when individual uh, regulations are being uh, referred to inside uh, a decision model. And of course, version control, how you keep uh, the version control of a model and external uh, knowledge sources in sync. And I also like to draw attention to decision implementation, uh, because one of the things that we're finding is not globally supported in the way perhaps it should be, is not only the support for test cases, but test case generation. In particular, the generation of test cases that where there's a partial or guaranteed coverage, where that is feasible, it's not always feasible, of course, um, and test case generation, which is designed to uh, prove the robustness of a decision model. So uh, test data that deliberately includes lots of, 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 da of bad data, and lastly, test cases which uh, show the runtime performance of a model and its uh, memory complexity. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Ryan. So we need your help. Please help us. Please join. Please consider joining the on-ramp committee. Um, the review committee needs you. Um, we are calling on all passionate and experienced industry practitioners, academics, and uh, vendors to, to join the review group and help us make this a reality. If you're interested or want to know more, please uh, use the email there to uh, to find out. Yeah, and I have Thanks. to say it's been a great, great learning experience uh, being on the group. I think you know, folks that join, um, you'll, you'll definitely learn a lot about DML, that's for sure. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. So, um, any questions? Yes. Thank you, Jen and uh, Ryan. Any questions? Okay. Uh, thank you again. And you guys can uh, post questions on Q&A or you have uh, email addresses uh, on this slide. So you can always ask uh, Ryan and uh, Jen later on. And of course, just uh, follow the request for membership. Uh, thank you. Okay.